We'd like to welcome you to our program. This is part four in our series over the book of Revelation. And we have um, been studying so far. We just finished uh, chapter one in our last program together. And in this broadcast, we're going to begin taking a look at the seven churches of Revelation chapter two and three. Those seven churches, of course, that we found out were to be lights to the world and to reflect the character and the glory of God. Before we open up and begin to look at the seven churches from Ephesus down to Laodicea, we're going to pray and ask uh, the Holy Spirit to guide us into all truth. Let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, we're so thankful that some of the mysteries so far in the book of Revelation through chapter 1 have melted away and we can understand it and we can see Jesus' compassion, his kindness, his mercy, his power, his glory, and his second coming. We're so thankful today for these wonderful, wonderful passages of Scripture. And now as we seek to understand some of the mysteries of the seven churches, we pray for the Holy Spirit to guide us. In Jesus' name, amen. As we noticed in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 4, that the book of Revelation is written to from John to the seven churches which are in Asia. And in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 11, we found that those seven churches were Ephesus and Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Now for a mail carrier in 95 AD who was having to carry mail throughout Asia Minor, if he began at the city of Ephesus and continued in a cir circuitous route around Asia Minor, he would indeed pass through those cities in the absolute and specific manner in which John mentioned them in Revelation chapter 1. He would go to Ephesus and then go up a little ways to Smyrna, per to Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. So as John writes these letters that have come from Jesus to John, they indeed represent seven literal churches that were in existence in John's day. But as we also mentioned right at the end of our last broadcast together, we're also going to find the experience of individual Christians and of different churches throughout the Christian era. And we will see those throughout the churches also. And we've also seen, and we're going to see, that these seven churches apply in history from the time of Jesus all the way down to the second coming. And you know, one quote that I'd like to read to you, it's from a book written by a historian, a church historian, by the name of J.A. Sice. And the book is called The Apocalypse, Volume 1, pages 142 to 145. Listen carefully to how Mr. Sice applies the seven churches. He says, These seven churches, besides being literal churches, they stand for the entire Christian body in all periods of its history. In the first place, the seven churches represent seven periods in the church's history, stretching from the time of the apostles to the coming again of Christ the characteristics of which are set forth partly in the names of these churches, but more fully in the epistles addressed to them. And then Mr. Seiss goes on to mention each one of the seven churches. He says that the church of Ephesus was a church that started out very on fire for Jesus, but then as the century went on, it began to cool off and it left its first love. And then, of course, the church of Smyrna in Revelation chapter 2, verses 8 through 11. We find repeatedly, Mr. Seiss tells us, it was a time of great persecution, a time of martyrdom for many in the church at that time. Following the church of Smyrna is the church of Pergamos. And the key person in the church of Pergamos, of course, is Balaam, found in Revelation 2 and verse 14. 
And we know that Balaam was known as the great compromiser. And we'll study him in detail in forthcoming broadcasts. The church of Thyatira is known for the symbol in scripture of Jezebel in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 20. The Thyatiran period was the age of the corruption that came and just broadsided the church of the dark ages. And Jezebel and the characteristics of Jezebel aptly apply to that time period. And then, of course, the church of Sardis in Revelation chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, was the church that, in the church time period, that claimed to be following God, claiming to be reforming and getting better. But in actuality, it was not reforming on a consistent basis, but was rather actually dying. Then, after the church of Sardis, we find in Revelation chapter 3, verses 7 through 13, we find the church of Philadelphia, the church of brotherly love, of great missionary outreach that was equivalent only to that which we find in the first century. So it was a great missionary period during the church of Philadelphia. And finally, the last final church is the lukewarm, self-sufficient professing people of God called Laodicea, a people that would come on the scene when judgment would begin in heaven. Let's go back now as we pick up in Revelation chapter 2 and let's take a look at the church of Ephesus. Starting with verse 1, Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in the in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Now obviously we know who holds the seven stars in his right hand, and those stars, of course, we found represented angels. And so Jesus holds those angels. The angels are under the command of Jesus Christ, and he tells them, he sends them in a perfect work in behalf of his church, he sends angels to uphold, to strengthen, to warn his people. And it says that Jesus is also the one who walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. So it's Jesus who gives a message to his church, the church of Ephesus. In verse 2 he says, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast labored and has not fainted. As Jesus beheld the church at Ephesus, and also as he watched the church at that time, Jesus had many good things to say about this time period. The word Ephesus itself means desirable. And of course, that which made the church of the first century so desirable was the fact that there were disciples, there were apostles that were walking the earth who had actually walked, had talked, had eaten, and had actually touched the Son of God. So the church of Ephesus, the desirable church, went from the time of Christ in 31 A.D., historically speaking, down to right about 100 A.D., when most historians conclude that it was at that point in time that all the disciples and apostles that had walked and talked and had communed with Christ were now dead. So the church of Ephesus goes from 31 A.D. down to right about 100 A.D., they were commended for many things. They labored for Christ. They did not stand those that were evil. They tried those who claimed to be apostles. They found them to be liars. And they showed great patience. And they didn't faint under trial. You know, the labors of the church of the first century are such that they bring a great rebuke to us today who sit so quietly and so reservedly while the world dies to hear of Jesus. You know, the labors of the Christians of the first century were so great that the Apostle Paul in Colossians chapter 1 
Colossians chapter 1 verse 23, Paul could make this most striking statement. He said this, If you continue in the faith grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. So the Apostle Paul could state right here to the church at Colossae that every creature under heaven heard the message of salvation in Jesus Christ in the first century. Now that was a great missionary effort and the Apostle Paul was right in the thick of it going from city to city preaching the gospel. But Paul could say that every person under heaven had heard the message of Jesus in the first century. So the church of Ephesus was a church that worked, a church that reached out and told the world of Christ and his matchless love. The church at that time period was also commended because they tried those who claimed to be apostles and found them to be liars. You know, the Bible doesn't talk too often about liars, but the few verses that do talk about them are very, very alarming. Number one, we know in John chapter 8 and verse 44 that the devil himself is called a liar, the father of lies. And of course, Jesus denounced the professed people of his day and he said, you are a bunch of liars. In John chapter 8, verses 44 and 45, Jesus said this, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar, and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, ye believe me not. So Jesus said that the devil is the ultimate liar, the father of lies, the one who has been making lies against God and his character for the last 6,000 years. You know, John, before writing the book of Revelation, wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, which come basically just prior to the book of Revelation. And in this passage, John comes down very, very hard and calls a group of people liars that I think holds tremendous weight for us today. In 1 John chapter 2, starting with verse 3, we read these words, And hereby we do know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word in him, verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. Now I don't believe for one moment that John was a legalist. I believe that John was a prophet of God one whom God highly honored, one whom God respected as a child of his. So much so that John was granted great insights and great light and even the opportunity to see Jesus on the island of Patmos. So when John wrote in this verse that we just read, when he said that those who know Jesus will keep his commandments, John was simply saying that through faith in the power of Jesus Christ, we can keep the commandments of God. And that is the experience of all those who truly know Jesus Christ. And in verse 4, John issued one of the strongest rebukes that I believe tumbles down 20 centuries and still rattles the cage of any professed Christian who dares to claim the name of Jesus Christ, but does not render obedience to his commands. John said, I, He that saith, I know him, the one who says, I believe in Jesus, but does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. So John 
and Jesus. Jesus said that they tried those who claimed to be liars, found that they weren't apostles, but found them indeed to not be telling the truth. And John declares in 1 John 2 that those who say they follow Jesus but don't honor the commandments of God, they're lying. Now, you know, I believe in our world today that if we take this one passage in 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 through 5, that you and I, friend, are going to have to make some decisions. If we are going to take the name of Jesus Christ and profess to be a follower of his, then we are going to honor all ten of the commandments of God. Not as a works trip, not as an attempt to get into heaven by what we do, but as a loving response to what Jesus has done for us. You see, when we recognize what Jesus has done and that sin is breaking the commandments of God and that sin broke the heart of the Savior of the world, then we will no longer make excuses for how we can continue to live in sin and be saved by Jesus Christ. No, we are rather going to be saying, Lord, make me hate sin. Make me despise anything that is not according to your commandments. And you know, I believe that the two greatest commandments that we see in our world today that are broken and busted and ripped apart again and again and again. And people say, well, we don't have to keep those commandments. Some of them are good, but some of them are faulty. And you know what two those are? Those are the two. Number four, which says to remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. How many of the professed Christian world today is keeping the seventh day Sabbath? That's a commandment of God. And the Bible says those who claim to follow Jesus Christ and don't keep God's commandments, including the fourth one, is a liar. And the truth is not in him. The other commandment that we find being broken constantly today by pastors and all kinds of people in the world is the seventh commandment that we should not commit adultery. Again and again and again, we find people excusing themselves and saying, well, I'm just going to break that one commandment, but I know God will forgive me. You know, if we take that position, eventually the power of the Holy Spirit to convict of sin, it will become so faint that it will disappear and we will die in our sins. You know, in James chapter 2, we find the Apostle James making this statement. In verses 8 through 12, If ye fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. But if you have respect to persons, you commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. For he that said, Do not commit adultery, said also, Do not kill. Now if ye commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. So speak ye, and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. So the great standard in the judgment the great standard that you and I will have to meet one day very, very soon is the law of God from commandment 1 to commandment 10. And if we are excusing the breaking of any one of God's 10 commandments, the Bible says if you offend in one point, if you break one of those and continue in that lifestyle, in that pattern of disobedience, in the judgment, you will be found guilty of breaking all those commandments by simply breaking the one. The law of God is a law of freedom. It's a, it's a wall of protection for those who find the beauty in the absolute authority of the principles of the Ten Commandments. So the Church of Ephesus in the first century they stop those who claim to be followers of God, who claim to be apostles, but who were really liars. 
In fact, the group of people that we find who claim to be followers of God but were indeed actually disobedient to the law of God, that was the group called the Nicolaitans. We find them mentioned in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 6. It says, But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. And the doctrine of the Nicolaitans is simply the belief that the gospel of Christ has made the law of God of no effect. That by believing in Jesus Christ, we're released from the law. We're released from being doers of God's law. So in essence, what we're saying to God is, is that God, I want you to forgive me for breaking the Ten Commandments, but now I'm going to go out and break them again so I can come back and ask you for forgiveness again. Now that's pretty foolish if you ask me. That's not liberty. That's not forgiveness. That's making, that's making license of the mercy and compassion of God. <coughs> so the Nicolaitans in, in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 6, who the church at Ephesus hated, were those who claimed that they believed in Christ, but they did not have to bring forth fruits of his character in their lives. The church of Ephesus was condemned for something. It was not a pure church. While it had the apostles there and the disciples, it was not a pure church. It was a church that received condemnation from Jesus also, that if they did not repent, Christ would have removed them out of their place. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 4 and 5, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place except thou repent. So the church of the first century left Jesus. They became cold. They became interested in their doctrines more than in Christ. They failed to see that every belief that they had had its focus in Jesus Christ, in his power to forgive and in his willingness to give strength for obedience. They turned away from Jesus and began to follow forms and customs and had left off their first love. And Jesus said, if you're going to take just a skeleton of religion, if you're just going to have a dry profession, you must repent. You must be sorry for your sins and turn away from them. And do the first works. Or else Jesus said, I will come unto you quickly and will remove your candlestick out of its place except you repent. You know, in our world today, the concept is, is that God is somehow a sugar daddy, a Santa Claus, a syrupy, sweet, lovey-dovey God that does not call people to repentance. Friend, the very fact that God is so long-suffering and kind makes for absolute certain the fact that judgment will fall. That if repentance does not come, God will indeed remove our candlestick. He will remove us out of our place. And he will give the work that we failed to do to somebody else. Oh yes, it's very important. Repentance is not being sorry for our sins and going out and doing them again and again and again and again. That's not true repentance in the Bible. True repentance is found in Proverbs chapter 28 and verse 13. He that covers his sin shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Jesus designs that as we come into his presence and as we confess our sins, as we recognize the awful price that sin caused, the fact that Jesus had to go to that awful place called Calvary, we will begin to understand how awful sin is. And we will then cry out to Jesus for power to resist 
the encroachments of evil. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, the Apostle Paul talked about this kind of repentance where the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 9 and 10, he said, Though now I rejoice, not that ye were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to repentance. For ye were made sorry after a godly manner. In verse 11 it says, For behold, this selfsame thing that ye sorrowed after a godly sort, what carefulness it wrought in you. Yea, what clearing of yourselves, yea, what indignation, yea, what fear, yea, what vehement desire, yea, what zeal, yea, what revenge. In all things ye have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. You know, for those who are willing to forsake the pleasures and sins of this world for a season, for just a short time, Jesus promises that we will have access to that glorious tree, the tree of life that Adam and Eve forfeited when they had to leave the garden because of their sins. Because to the church at Ephesus, the promise is in Revelation 2 and verse 7, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. You and I have a decision to make just as the church at Ephesus did. Will we choose to repent? Will we choose to forsake sin through the grace and power of Christ by giving our wills into his hands? Or will we have our candlestick removed out of its place? Will the light of truth be blotted out of our lives and we will no more walk with Jesus? Oh, friend, I pray that the decision that you will make, that you will choose to repent, that you will choose to put away all sin so that the grace of Jesus Christ can so fill your life that you and I together can one day eat of the tree of life. Let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, we're thankful that we can opt that we can choose to forsake sin for a season. We thank you for Jesus today, that by his grace and power, we can overcome. And we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. As is our custom, we'd like to offer you a free book that goes along with today's program, plus a free study guide over Lesson 4, Please specify that when you write to Truth Triumphant, Post Office Box 1417, Eustis, Florida, 32727, USA. Until we meet again, may God richly bless you.